I'm trying to make is this. These truths in the book of Ephesians, specifically one, and even today what we're going to be sharing, literally, you talk about caffeine in my veins, literally. Caffeine, power, that when we began to see what God has made available for us, he's made so much available for us. And today, I truly believe if you will keep yourself completely open and have your receivers up, God's going to reveal some incredible truths to you that will radically change your life. So let's say this together. Say, today, I will hear the voice of God through the word of God. My eyes will be enlightened. I will be changed. Turn to someone and say, I will be changed. Turn to somebody else and say, neighbor, I will be changed. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we declared your word, and I just believe right now your spirit is moving in our souls. We have opened our hearts up to you to receive, and you're so gracious and you're so faithful to pour your love and your grace in us as we unpack your holy written word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to get right into this book of Ephesians, and I'm not going to go into what we covered in chapter one, but the main theme of what... The Apostle Paul is trying to get over through the book of Ephesians. And who is the Apostle Paul? He is the actual author of the book of Ephesians. He was a church planter. He planted churches in the Asian Minor. And this was not actually a book that was written. It was a letter. And it was a letter that was written to the church at Ephesus, but it was to be circulated to all of the churches that he had planted. Now, he wrote this letter while he was in prison, going through just a little bit of a trial, kind of like the trials that we go through. Are you in prison today? So your trial is nothing compared to his, right? So um, now the reason why he wrote this letter or the book of Ephesians, he had written a previous book, the book of Colossians, which was also a letter that was circulated. But after he wrote that letter, God began to give him further revelation regarding what God wanted to do through the church. Who's the church? You and I are the church. One's an arm, one's a leg, one's a toenail, one's a heart. We're all called the body of Jesus Christ. He's the head. We're his body. He does not work independent of us. We don't work independent of him. We are one. And that's a made a big, big thing that he talks about even in, in chapter 3. But what he wanted to get over, God was getting over to the Apostle Paul that God, through the church, literally wanted to overthrow, confuse, and stun evil powers through the church. And so the Apostle Paul, he's seeing the kind of power, the kind of authority that the church is supposed to operate in. He's seeing their purpose and their destiny. He's looking at all this and he's going, oh my God, literally. So then what he says, okay, okay, then I'm going to have to equip, I'm going to have to mature, I'm going to have to get the church ready to do what they've been called to do. So his tone throughout the book of Ephesians is it's very excited. It's very, it's purpose-driven. And we talked about throughout the whole book, the underlying theme is this. And we said this on the first week. It's, he was trying to get over to the church. I want you to see his grand plan. I want you to know what's available for you. And I want you to experience his power. I want you to see. I want you to know. I want you to experience. Come on, say, I want you to see. I want you to know, I want you to experience. That was his main theme, and he's so excited. Did you ever have somebody, maybe you received, some of you men, you, maybe you got a new power tool, and it has all kinds of gadgets on it, and you're so excited about it, and like you're calling your friends and your neighbors and even your wife, because you're going to definitely use it in the house, and you say, oh, look, it does this, oh, and it looks this, and oh, it can benefit you here, and it can benefit you there, and it, it's really cool. That's his attitude. He's so excited to reveal what God has made available. And we talked about when we first did this, ignorance is not bliss. What we don't know can hurt us. It can hurt us. And so we can know as we unpack the word of God. So we're going to jump into Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. And he begins this portion of scripture in, in the beginning of Ephesians 3, reiterating some things regarding a mystery being revealed. A mystery was revealed to him for the church that had been hidden. 
And it had all to do with what we talked about in the first installment, that in Christ, God was bringing heaven and earth, all humanity, under one head, that's Christ. So let's pick up in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6, and it says this, and this is God's plan, or this is the mystery that's been revealed. Both Gentiles and Jews, who are Gentiles, that's all non-Jews, okay? That's you and I, unless you're Jewish, okay? All, um, this is God's plan, both Jews and Gentiles who believe the good news, the good news that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that now through his life, through what he did, we have access to become children of God, heirs together with Jesus Christ. Huge, huge principle. Uh, regarding, okay, and that uh, believe the good news, share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Anybody excited about that little verse there? That both Jews and Gentiles who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Who's God's children? Come on, say, I'm God's child. I can inherit the riches of the kingdom. Okay. Both are part of the same body. The Jew and the Gentile, they're both part of Jesus right now. And both enjoy the promises of blessings or the covenant promises that were given to the Jews. They're now available to the Gentiles or all non-Jews. Covenant blessings. They belong to Christ Jesus. Now listen. When he was preaching this kind of stuff, this is the main reason why the Apostle Paul was persecuted. Wow, why the Jews wanted to assassinate him. They couldn't wrap their brains around the fact that no longer were you a child of God because you were a Jew or because you were circumcised, ouch, or because, you know, you, you, you had the, you, you were believed the law, you operated in the law. He's saying, no, 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 that's done away with. Now, it's all about grace. It's about you receiving what Christ has done, him coming in and literally changing you to be a new creature, a child of God with now his nature. Now, once that happens to you, now you intrinsically will follow and do the things that are like your dad. But they did it the opposite way. You got to do, you got to do, you got to do, and maybe you'll be accepted. And, and, and the Apostle Paul saying, no, 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 it's not that way anymore. All can become children of God. And the Jews were like, uh-uh. And so that's why he was being persecuted. So he begins by reiterating this mystery. But then he's, gonna, he's going to get into the purpose of this mystery. It's almost as if God was doing this to the Apostle Paul. And he was going, oh, this is what you're doing. This is what you're doing. And he was so excited. And today... We're going to have that aha moment ourselves. Because what God has for you and I is far greater, far greater than what you see with your natural eye. And I believe today you're going to see with your spiritual eyes how much God loves you, what he wants to do with your life, that you are a person of purpose and destiny, that you are not a mistake, that God has great things for you in, in mind. So let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8. And for those of you who are visiting for the first time, we actually have in your worship guide the little notes that you can uh, follow along if you so choose to and to make notes. A lot of our people, they go back and they study these, these truths and get them in their soul. So Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Although I am less than the least of all of Lord's people. Why did, why did he say that? The Apostle Paul, he killed a lot of Christians before he actually was converted to be a Christian. So he always saw himself... You know, as the least, man, I, I did some of the worst things that you could possibly do. Some of us have felt that way, right? Although I'm less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me, this ability, this gift. And every single one of us, we're going to see even next week, or not next week, in two weeks. I, I probably should tell you why I'm not in chapter two, right? Because I'm in chapter three instead of two. Um, when we put the series together, we put it together with me doing one, Pastor Dan doing two, me doing three, and so forth. But then, you know, life happens, and business happens. So Pastor Dan is going to be unpacking chapter two. I'll be unpacking chapter three, and I'll be in chap uh, unpacking chapter four as well. So he says here, this grace was given to me. Everybody has a gift or an ability that God places on the inside of them. 
And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Do you think he's really getting this over to us? These riches, these unsearchable riches. It says in the, in the New King James, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. Or how does this mystery, how God's brought all things under one head through Jesus Christ, how we are all one, we are his body, to kind of make known how does this actually work. That's what he's saying. Which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. So it was hidden at one time. Before the cross, it was hidden. His intent, say his intent. Or how about this? His purpose. His purpose was that now all that he's doing, all of this mystery, that now through the church, who's the church? Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, the character, the power, the authority, all the myriad faces of God. Look at this. The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. What is God saying there? He's saying that God wanted to display, to operate in his character, in his power, and all that he is through the church and display it to every ruler of darkness. You're like, really? Me? Now, this was a huge, huge undertaking. That's why the Apostle Paul was so serious about this particular book. Because he's seen this is what God wants to do. But isn't it true, all of us, you know, when, when we talk about the heavenly realms and the spirit realm and heaven, it seems so far away, right? We forget that there's a whole other realm that's unseen that's surrounding us. And I talked about this in the first installment, that the spirit realm covers the natural realm or shapes the natural realm. The natural realm does not shape the spirit realm. So what's happening up there is really the main deal. That's why the Apostle Paul said that we're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because if it has its origin there, ooh, it's the potential to have its origin in the natural realm. So we get busy living our lives, you know, we're changing diapers and we're making dinner and we're going to work and we're still dealing with, you know, our anger issues and we're going to soccer games and graduations and we're living our lives, we're living our lives and sometimes we lose sight what's really going on in the realms of the spirit. Come on, anybody with me? Right? And the thing is this, there's a lot of stuff going on out there. It's not as it seems. It's not as it seems, folks. There's some covert activity happening on there. And really, the message today, the title of my message, is covert activity. There's things in the unseen realm that the Apostle Paul wanted us to lay hold of. It's not as it seems. Watch this video. Yes, but I want to carry an umbrella. 
It looked like just an antique shop. Right? Just an antique shop. But it wasn't an antique shop, was it? There was some, there was some covert activity going on. Far bigger, far greater than meets the eye. Far bigger and far greater than meets the eye. I think right here I want to just give you a little testimony. And then I'll get into, we're going to unpack some scriptures to kind of give you a little bit more about this. Um, my kids, since they were probably 18 months old, nine, or uh, 18 months old, two years old, uh, we all began to, as a family, meditate and memorize Psalm 91, which is all about protection. All about protection. And, you know, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall rest under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but we memorized it. And we would, every time we'd get in the car, uh, we would say it. Every time we'd get in the car, we would say it as a family. So now, you know, my, my second oldest daughter, she is going to be 19 in August. And um, a couple of weeks ago, it was a Sunday night, uh, she's sitting down at the, at the keyboard, and she writes a song on Psalm 91. I mean, after all of these years of reciting Psalm 91, she writes a song? So she's writing this song. Oh, my, you've got to hear this song. And, you know, I'm just, just so blessed by it, and hopefully we can bring it here. It was such a blessing. That was Sunday night, okay? Now, remember, as you're worshiping, you're declaring the Word of God, right? There's power in the Word of God. There's power. God's promised us protection. It's in Psalm 91. In fact, those of you who are new here, you just read that this week. It, it'll just so bless you. So Monday night, I'm getting in bed. It's 10 o'clock, and my daughters had gone to celebrate a birthday uh, with family in Fort Myers, and we get a call that they had been in a car accident. And in the car accident, there were two cars that hit Alexa's car. So um, we get the call, we get in the car, we go, that, we go down there, and, and when we drove up, if you guys could see the car, the car was completely totaled. Completely totaled. Good news for Alexa, she's getting a new car, you know? <laughs> completely totaled. My girls walked out of that car accident, not a scratch, not one thing. Not one thing. And if you all could have seen the people who were looking at the car and looking at them. I was driving down the freeway, thanking the Lord that I was not going to a hospital. Why? The promises of Psalm 91. Let me just tell you what was going on in the unseen realm. There were these huge angels that we've been talking to and declaring that they watch over our family. They were really busy that night. And I, get you, I bet you they have a few bruises today because they took the brunt. And my kids walked out healed, safe. I give you glory, God. I give you praise. I give you praise because a part of that promise in Psalm 91, it says, with long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. That word was at work that night. And my kids, and I give God all the glory and all the praise. I'm, I didn't have to go to a morgue. I did not have to go to a hospital. I just had to bring my babies home. It's awesome. So let's go over to Daniel, chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. There is covert activity in the unseen realm. There's stuff happening. It's not as it seems. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background with this particular scripture. This prophet, his name is Daniel. He, is, um, he sets himself to pray. He recognizes times and seasons. Now, the people of Israel at this time, they're in enslaved or in captivity to the Persians. And they became enslaved by their own fruition because they chose their ways over God's. And when we choose our ways over God's, we end up enslaving ourselves. So they're enslaved, but Daniel, he recognizes, wait a second, the time period based on scriptures is about 70 years, and it's been about 70 years, so they should be freed by now. So he sets himself to seek the Lord for 20, uh, we don't know how long the period was, but we were picking up an angelic being visiting him after he had been praying for 21 days. 
And this angelic being said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. When was it heard? When? When, when, when was it heard? The first day he prayed. But 21 days later, the answer came. What does it say to you and I? The first time you pray, it's heard. Do you ever feel like, oh, are you hearing me, God? I think it just hit the ceiling. It didn't get anywhere. Anybody felt like that? Your feelings, they're just indicators. They're not the truth, okay? The first time you pray, it's heard. It's heard. But for 21 days, the spirit prince, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. What is he saying? Persia was in was, a, was the world power at that time, and there was a natural Persian prince. But in the unseen realm, there was a spirit prince that was designated by Satan to manipulate the affairs in Persia to go contrary to God's ways. There was a natural prince, then there was something right above that was pulling some strings. Pulling some strings. I'm going to tell you this, I don't want to be a puppet. I don't want to be a puppet. We were created to walk in authority, right? So watch this. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of, of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, can someone do this? Whistle like really loud. Come on, Rick. Yeah, that's what I believe happened. Okay. Michael! Help! Okay. So Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia so I could come to you, Daniel. What is going on? I mean, this is Star Wars, you know? This is like, you know, what you see at the movies. Where do you think they get all that? There was something happening up there that was influencing what was happening here. And Daniel's prayer was releasing God's activity to intervene in the manipulation of the adversary. That's pretty cool. Some of you are going to get that when you go home. I'd get the CD because you need to hear that. The enemy is manipulating things in your life. And you've got the Holy Spirit. You've got angels at your beck and call to go in into that realms of the Spirit and put him at bay. Only because you have the name of Jesus, not because you're all that. And not because you do everything so right. But because he is in you and you believe in the power of his name and not your own. Not your own. It's his name. Okay? Let's, let's take another example. I just want to show you some covert activity. It's not as it seems. 2 Kings verses 6, 14 through 17. I'll give you a little background with this particular portion of Scripture. The king of Iram is really ticked off at another prophet. His name is Elisha. And the reason why he's ticked off with Elisha is that Elisha, who's very close to God, who spends time hearing from God, every time the king of Aram is going to do some kind of a strategy in battle, Elisha declares it out loud, and the king keeps losing. So finally, the king of Aram said, I'm done, I'm going to kill him. So he sends his army to go find Elisha, and he's at some little town, and his, his servant's with him, and they're surrounding the city. I'd be just a little afraid, wouldn't you? No, maybe you're not. Maybe you're just so holy and spiritual and so full of God. <clears throat> so it says, when the servant of the man of God got up and went, up, went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord! He pooped his pants. I trust me, he pooped his pants. What shall we do? The servant asked. Just look at Elisha. He's so cool. So laid back. Ah, don't be afraid. The prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I'm telling you, if you've got your Bibles open, you've got your notes up, you circle that, get that in you, look at that. The, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And it's the same prayer that the Apostle Paul was praying throughout the book of Ephesians. Oh, I'm praying that they would see, that their eyes, oh, that they would be enlightened, 
to the hope of their calling, their purpose, to that great inheritance in the saints, all the provision that you have for them, all that they would see, that power that you have for them. The Apostle Paul prayed the same prayer. And guess what? That's in Ephesians chapter 1. We pray that prayer over you. Almost every single day, we pray that prayer over all those who call themselves Life Christian Church. Our intercessory prayer team prays that over you every Saturday. In Ephesians 3, 2, which we'll get to. If he prayed it over the church, oh, we better be praying it over the church, right? Because there's power in this prayer. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So there was this natural army surrounding the city. But there was this huge army in the heavenly realms right above them that far outnumbered that natural army. I'm painting a picture for a reason. There are more for you than against you. Does it feel like it? Most of the time. Most of the time, it doesn't feel like there's more for us than against us. Most of the time, we feel, I'm just by myself fighting this battle. But in reality, there's more for us than against us. And let me tell you, it takes time for this mind to catch up to what's actual. And it catches up the more that we are in the Word of God, because the Word of God trains our mind to cooperate with our spirit that goes into the heavenlies. Let me say that one more time. The Word of God trains our mind to cooperate with our spirit that goes into the heavenlies. Your first is spirit. Your, your body is going to eventually give out. And your spirit is going to go to heaven or to hell, determining on whether or not you choose to let Jesus save or you want to save yourself. If we receive Christ and, and accept what he did on the cross, he pays for our sins. But if we don't want to receive him and we can't see that he did that for us, then we pay for our sins and we go to hell. Someone's going to pay for sins. He chose to pay it for us. That's why it's a free gift. All we have to do is receive it. Receive it. The kingdom of God is about receiving. So there's this activity going on. It's not as it seems. And the Apostle Paul is saying, okay, there's a bigger picture. It's not just making your bacon and eggs in the morning. It's not just getting your paycheck. There's a bigger picture. And God wants to use you to be a part of a bigger picture. And I thought about this in the garden. That's exactly what it was. When every heavenly host saw Adam and Eve, they went, oh, that looks like Jesus. And that's what he wants again. That every heavenly host would look at us and go, oh, that looks like Jesus. Hard undertaking, don't you think? Don't you think? Because of what? Trials and troubles and issues and because we're in a process. I know that when I began my walk with the Lord, I was a lot more angry than I am today. How about you? I was really impatient when I first started to walk with God. I felt sorry for everybody around me. But I'm a lot more patient today right? I used to have an issue falling asleep because I had so much fear. Now I fall asleep before, you know, like that I fall asleep. I can fall asleep anywhere. It's a miracle when how it was before because we're in a process, in a process of becoming like him. So what, we're, we'll talk about a little bit more about unseen things, but let's, t let's define what is the manifold wisdom of God? What is the manifold wisdom of God? Let's look at James chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. It says, But if you are bitterly jealous and there's selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. Now watch this. For jealousy and selfishness, they're not of God's kind of wisdom, or it's not the manifold wisdom of God. It's not heaven's wisdom. Okay? Such things, look at this, are earthly, lower nature, unspiritual, and demonic. Why? Why? You mean when I'm selfish, it's all about me, and I'm jealous, I can be cooperating with the enemy? That's what it's saying. But most of us don't know that, right? We're just living our life, just being like everybody else. But see, we're getting insight. It's not as it seems. It's not as it seems. The enemy wants to trap us with these little foxes. But the manifold wisdom, what is the manifold wisdom? That's your next point. 
But the wisdom from above, the wisdom from above, or heaven's wisdom, or manifold wisdom, say, come on, manifold wisdom, is first of all pure. It is also peace-loving, gentle at all times, willing to yield to others. How many of you like to be right? <laughs> How many of you insist on being right when you're wrong? I have some honest people. Oh, come on. You know you're wrong, but you don't want to be wrong. You want to be right. And then you make up all kinds of stories and you make up all kinds of layers. Come on. I've got some honest people. Love you. I got delivered of that a few times. <laughs> Who knows if it'll raise its head again. So willing to yield. It's full of mercy and good deeds. It shows no favoritism and it's sincere. It's sincere. Look at the contrast. One is all about me and the other is all about others. Selfishness versus kindness. So he's saying there's this difference between earthly wisdom and manifold wisdom. And he's saying, I want the church. I've empowered the church, which you will see, to display my manifold wisdom. God would never require something of us without empowering us to do it. Ever. He would say, I'll just kind of make, just see what you can do with it. No, that's not God. He'll say, this is what I have for you, and I'm going to give you every tool necessary to be that. I'm going to equip you. That's what's so neat about God. He's such an all-inclusive God. So, now watch this. Operating, your next point, operating in the manifold wisdom of God is actually spiritual warfare. It is spiritual warfare. Now think about this, okay? How many of you at one time, I bind you, devil, in the name of Jesus. I resist you, devil, in the name of Jesus. How many of you ever prayed that prayer? I come against you in the name of Jesus. Now watch. If I'm operating in selfishness and jealousy, okay, the Scripture says that I'm actually cooperating with evil, correct? So I'm actually holding its hand. I'm holding its hand and saying, I resist you in Jesus' name. I resist you in Jesus' name. Now, come on, is that stupid or what? But that's what we do. When we operate in the flesh and those outward things, we're actually cooperating with a lower nature that we've been delivered of. And we're doing it because, you know, this has been our life and this is, this is how we live our lives. But that's why you come to Christ. You begin to unpack the Word of God. It begins to change your way of thinking and it begins to shape how you live out your life and reflect Him. It's a process. So it says here, so when, so now look at the scripture, uh, James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, therefore, submit to God. What does it mean to submit to God? It simply means, it simply means to do it His way, not our way. How many of you can say that if someone really, really hurts you or bothers you, that your way would be to slap them on the face? Maybe you didn't physically do it, but you thought it. Right? But God's way says turn the other cheek. Are you kidding me? Do you know what they did to me? And, and we do it. We, we really feel we deserve the right to be offended. We deserve the right to be hurt because this happened and that happened. You're absolutely right, but is it the healthiest thing for you? It's not. So submitting to God simply means I'm going to do it his way, even though it may not make sense here, and even though my flesh wants to do something different, I trust he knows me and has my back, so I'm going to submit to his way. Notice the next part of that verse. It says, resist the devil. So there's no resisting without no submitting. Do we see that? There's no resisting without submitting. And so, and I believe this submitting to God is a process. It's something that we grow in day by day as we continue to know and to walk with the Lord. So watch this. As we grow in the manifold wisdom, as we're growing in patience and long-suffering and kindness, as we're growing and, you know, insist, not insisting on our way, as we're growing in that, guess what? Our authority and power grows right alongside. They go hand in hand. No authority without growing in the manifold wisdom of God. And the Apostle Paul knew this. He understood that we would be powerless unless we were growing in this manifold wisdom because the manifold wisdom, it is Him. And it means we're submitted to Him against what our feelings say. It means I trust you more than what it looks like and what it feels like. It's not an easy thing to do. 
That's why he prays a real powerful prayer. I could see the Apostle Paul saying, okay, you want to use the church in tremendous power, and you want to display yourself through the church to principalities. This is a really difficult thing because of what? Trials and troubles and how we're still in this process, right? You know, we go through a trial, we go through a trouble, and, and, and we start getting upset and mad and even blaming God, right? And so, and when I was putting this together, the Lord said this to me, that the troubles, the trials, they're smoke screens to what's really going on. The troubles and the trials, the enemy wants it to be a smoke screen that you and I would focus on the trouble, focus on, I'm still in a process, focus on the issue, instead of looking at the bigger picture that God is working something so great in your life. That he wants to use you. He wants to use you in a powerful way. The Apostle Paul understood this, and that's why he goes on and he prays, and he himself is in a trial, and he recognizes, oh boy, when we go through trials, we forget the big picture. Anybody? We forget why we've got breath in our body when we're going through a trouble or a pressure of some sort. That's why it's so important to be united with other people, because they can strengthen you and encourage you and speak God's promise back to you when you're doubting it yourself. That's why we're a small group church, because we need each other to be strong and to fulfill who we're called to be as individuals and corporately. So the Apostle Paul, he's recognizing all of this. Oh my, this is so huge. And, and I know that they're up and down and all over the place. And I got to pray. That's what he says. Not like that, but he said, I got to pray. Look at what he says here in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. When I think of all this... He's having a day, right? When I think of all this, this grand plan and, and what you want to do, and, and, and oh my gosh, but we're so fleshly and, and, we, and we have so many issues. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father. I believe he was hitting his head on the ground, not just praying. Oh my, right? I fall to my knees in prayer that the creator of everything in heaven on earth, now watch this. He's praying something specific. This is for you. This is something you can pray on you. I pray this prayer every single day. I pray this over me, and I pray this over you. He says this, I pray that from his, this is God's, glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength. That means dynamic, miraculous power and ability in or through his spirit. In other words, this. Your, God's spirit connected himself to your spirit. And he's praying that God, you will supernaturally, that's your first point, you will supernaturally touch them in their inner being. Supernatural substance in their inner being. That's the only way they're going to be able to stand in these trials and keep their eyes up on a bigger picture of what you've made them to be. So your first point is this. He was praying, they need a supernatural touch right in their spirit, in the unseen realm, because if it, if it affects the unseen realm, we'll see it out here. We'll see it out here. Now, this is not automatic. My husband, he may have all kinds of great intentions. Man, today I, I, I just want to do this for my wife, and we're going to have a great night tonight. I just want to just love on her today, love on her tonight and in the morning, and... I just want to love on her. We're going on vacation soon. I'm excited. Okay. Now watch this. He can have great intention, even have a great desire. But I've got to be in a position to receive. Right? He can have all the desire to, 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 to just transfer his love to me. But I've got to be in a place to receive it. He goes, hey, baby, baby. Oh, I'm busy. I'm doing, I'm doing life. Right? I've got to be in a position to receive. Listen, you and I need to be in a position to receive that supernatural touch. And not just once. It's a continual touch. It's continual. In fact, I, I think how it says here, uh, one of the scriptures that really came to me as I was putting this together, in Psalm 16 it says, in your presence is fullness. In your presence, when I'm, in, when I'm talking to you, when I'm worshiping you, when I'm in the Word, I'm in your presence, I can receive fullness. There's fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Mm -mm -mm. Where? In his presence. I've put myself in a place to receive. 
I put myself in a place to receive. Now, quite interesting, the next, and this is a consistent thing. Say consistent. I talk to my husband every single day. And even when he's out of town, we're texting, we're talking. There's a consistency to our relationship, okay? God wants a consistency in our relationship. He goes on to say this. Now watch this. I love the word then. So we put ourselves in a place to receive. There's this consistent touch. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts, and you will trust in him. Your roots will grow, will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. That word, make his home, it means to dwell permanently. There's a difference between visiting God and dwelling with God. There's a difference. You know, my mom's been away, and I've been going to her house to do a couple of things. And when I walk into her house, because she lives there, she doesn't just visit once a month or every six months. She lives there. When I walk into that house, her smell is all over the place. There's a residue of mom all over her home because she lives there. That's what he's talking about, that you've been so consistent in his presence that there's a residue of him in every area of your life. There's a residue of him. You smell like him. You look like him. You're him to every demonic principality in the heavenly realms. And that dwelling, that consistency, that residue, it produces an unshakable faith. I'm not moved because my God is for me. There's more for me than against me. He loves me. It creates that love that's so rooted, so unshakable. And then it goes on to say, and may you have power to understand Power to understand, that it actually means may you have the power to lay hold of. Come on, say lay hold of. Possesses your own, it means. Christ's love. No one can do that for you. So many times we say, oh yeah, God loves you. But he's saying, no, 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 you lay hold of the fact that he loves you. Lay hold of it personally. That's your next point. Verse 19, may you experience the love of Christ. So first he says, okay, I'm praying that you have a supernatural touch. He starts the process. Then I'm praying that you're going to lay hold of Christ's love for you. Then he says, now I'm praying that you may experience his love. What does that mean? It means this. Knowing God intimately, to know by experience or effort, knowledge as a result of prolonged practice, prolonged communication, prolonged interaction, prolonged experience. It sounds like, you know, a deep relationship, a deep, intimate relationship. This is what he wants us to experience. And what does that produce? Security, fearlessness. I can face anything. He's with me. He loves me. Look at, this is what he was praying. The apostle Paul prayed this over the church. We pray this over you, that you would have a supernatural touch in your inner being, that you lay hold of Christ's love for you, that you would experience intimately his love for you. Now look at, then, come on, say then. Then. That got my attention. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Listen, folks, come on now. We all want to feel complete, full, and whole. But notice there's a key to, to it. We've got to be praying. I'm going to be strengthened in my inner man. I receive a supernatural touch from God. God, you're helping me to lay hold of your love for me. God, I'm experiencing your love. I'm in this relationship with you. I'm pursuing you. You're pursuing me. I'm growing. I'm growing. I'm growing. Then we experience complete, full life of God. It's all about relationship. So we need to position ourselves for greatness. It's real simple. Real simple, Matt. You can climb up. Real simple. Show up. Get in a place to receive just open your hearts. I mean, I, sometimes I feel like God's running around going, I need a place to touch down. And we're so busy, busy, busy. And he's saying, just stop and receive. Stop and receive. Show up and receive. That's why here at Life Christian Church, we always talk about having a time with the Lord and being in his presence and being in prayer. And you may say, I don't know how to do that. Well, get in a small group. Get with one of the leaders here. We'll help you. We'll come alongside you. We do it for so many people because we know how important it is. We know that the enemy does not want you to know this stuff because he wants to, you to be a puppet not a victorious, overcoming Christian as you were created to be? Show up. Next is ju just your mindset. I'm going to read these couple of scriptures and then we'll, we're going to close. It says, this is the Apostle Paul, for our present troubles, they're small. It's not as it seems, guys. Our present troubles, oh, they're just small. 
They won't last very long. They're temporary. They're subject to change. Look at his mindset. How many times we look at the trial and the trouble? Oh, my God! And he's saying, no, they're small. They're subject to change. Look at his mindset. Why? Because his mind is on a bigger God and not the problem. A bigger God and not the problem. Oh, gosh, so many, so many little things for you and I today. So many little truths for you and I today. For our, our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us glory! Glory! Power! Splendor that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So the problem is nothing like the power. The problem is nothing compared to the glory. That's what he's saying. Nothing! Nothing! He goes on, to say, while we do not look at the things which are seen, the trouble, I'm still a mess, I'm still angry, I'm still battling an addiction, I'm still, I'm still, don't look at that. He said, look to the unseen, that you are going through a process, that there's supernatural power available, that God has a bigger picture for your life, far greater than you can even imagine. What are the things which are, are not seen? For the things which are seen, they're temporary. This is going to pass away. But the things which are unseen, the greater picture, the greater idea, it's going to last forever. And so we have to focus on the unseen, guys. It's not as it seems. We have to focus on the unseen. There's covert activity. And I love how he ends this, this portion of Scripture. He says, now to him who's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think. According to what? According to the power, dunamis, dynamic, miraculous power, that what? Works or operates in us. It's not independent of him, it's with him. Someone's getting it. You're not a mistake. You're not a doormat. You're a child of the living God. Every head bowed. When I was praying about this service, I saw this, and I want to give you an opportunity. How many of you, you know, with, with, again, with your eyes closed and your head bowed, how many of you can say, you know something, I struggle with that place of receiving? I don't know why, and you don't have to figure out the why. You may struggle with that place of receiving. And right now, we're going to show you how simple it really is. I want to lead you just in a prayer of just not yet receiving Christ. We'll get there. But I want you to see how it's by faith you receive a touch from God. It's not by a feeling. It's by simply surrendering. And for me, in the morning, I lift my hands and I say, Lord, again today I just receive a supernatural touch in my inner man by your spirit. I just receive it, God. I don't want to live this day in my strength and in my wisdom and in my power. Oh, but God, I'm so grateful you made a way that I can receive. And I receive it right now. And I believe as I'm saying that, by faith in the unseen realm, God is strengthening my spirit being to face whatever it is that I need to face and win. And win. Not just face it, but win. So I want to lead us in that prayer first. If that's you, you know, I have a hard time receiving. We're going to pray this together. Come on, I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I ask you, strengthen me in my inner being by your spirit. I receive your touch. I receive your touch right now. And I just thank you for it. I just thank you for it. With every head bowed, I want to pray. You may be here and you've never ever even heard about receiving Christ or that you can be a child of God. That God wants to do a great work in your life. And if that's you, I want to offer another prayer for you. To lead you in a prayer to where you become a child of God, giving God an opportunity to, to take his Holy Spirit and put it into your human spirit and make you a new creature. It's called being born anew. And if that's you, you've never, ever received Jesus into your, you never prayed that prayer. It's a simple prayer. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you, you want to be included in that prayer. I'm going to surrender my life today. I want a new life. I want his life. If that is you, with every head bow never eye closed just raise your hand and say I want to receive Christ I want to be born anew today I want new life in me new life in me I see that hand I see that hand oh I give you praise Father you're here you need to recommit your life back to him you've been living a mundane life and it's time to just operate in what God's called you to be if that's you come on just raise your hand and say I got to come back to God I'm recommitting my life to God I see that hand 
I give you praise. I see that hand. Oh, I give you praise. Let's pray this prayer together. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you, come into my heart. Make me new. I surrender my life completely to you. And I receive your spirit into my human spirit. Today, I become a child of God. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. Amen.